Hello, my name is Rick Seifert, and I serve on the online ministry team. Our scripture lesson for today comes from John's Gospel, chapter 1, verses 35 through 51. It's a story that comes to us early on in Jesus' ministry and is the first thing Jesus does after being baptized by John the Baptist. He gathers and calls disciples to join his ministry. Listen for the word of God for us today from John 1, 35 through 51. The next day, John was standing again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus walking along, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard what he said, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them following, he asked, What are you looking for? They said, Rabbi, which is translated teacher. Where are you staying? He replied, Come and see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. One of the disciples who heard what John said and followed Jesus was Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated Christ. He led him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You will, be, you will be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. The next day, Jesus wanted to go into Galilee, and he found Philip. Jesus said to him, follow me. Philip was from Bethsaida, the hometown of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and the prophets, Jesus, Joseph's son from Nazareth. Nathanael responded, Can anything from Nazareth be good? Philip said, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said about him, Here is a genuine Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, how do you know me? Jesus answered, Before Philip called you, I saw you under the fig tree. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are God's son. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered, Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. I assure you, that you will see heaven open and God's angels going up to heaven and down to earth on the human one. A word of God that is still speaking. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Oh Lord God, we thank you for this opportunity to gather together today and to listen for the word that you have for us. Pour down your Holy Spirit so that we might all have ears to hear, eyes to see, hearts to love, and minds to know. Be with us all, we pray. Amen. Well, I want to begin this morning by thanking you all for the opportunity to be here with you this morning. As Chris mentioned, I'm the local pastor of a Presbyterian church in the same city, and of course, there are many familiar names and faces here. Together, our churches have worked uh, to welcome the refugee, we've worked on Presbytery committees, we've worked on installation commissions. Our two communities have a lot in common including we both have amazing children and youth educators that are nationally known and recognized in their field, and we are both so lucky to have them. They happen to share not only an occupation and not only a home, but they also share a name as well. Our Chris Adler Bremer is actually a child of this community. In fact, she is still a member here at First Presbyterian. And so our communities have a lot in common, even the people we know and love. Our communities also share a love for the people and the place of South Sudan. 
Just this past summer, we joined together with the Sudan, South Sudan Mission Network of the PCUSA, which is the oldest mission network of our denomination. The purpose of this network is to share in our commitment to a partnership of mission and ministry for this holy and beloved place on the other side of the world. So I will confess to you all this morning that I have heard recently a sermon on this particular text preached by your pastor, Jacques. It was during his delivery of this sermon at the Mission Network Conference that I realized that this is actually a really interesting little passage and I've never preached on it. It's one I've always chosen to skip over. You see, I'm not usually a lectionary preacher, but even if I were, this passage competes with Mark's gospel in Epiphany Year B. And Mark's gospel is my favorite, pretty much because it's everything that John's gospel isn't. I find the story here kind of confusing, kind of hard to follow. As usual, I find John here to be pretty wordy. With references to things John assumes we know and connect, even though my memory isn't really that good for that sort of thing. He's laying down the themes of lost and found, of seeing and believing, of invitation and acceptance. As is often the case in John's gospel, there is a story of what is really literally happening, and then also the allegory and the thing that is applicable to all the actual call story of Andrew, Simon, Philip, and Nathaniel. Maybe it's worth taking a few moments to break down the story to a more simplified version, where maybe the most important thing to note is that, the, that John, the gospel sharer, um, has the other John in this story not actually baptizing, although this story follows after what would be the baptism. Rather, John tells the story of this John and makes him the witnesser, not the baptizer. He's the one who sees Jesus as the Lamb of God and shares that knowledge with his own followers, with those who are surrounding him. Look, he says, it's the Lamb of God. And then it's the people here, it's the followers who get busy. They initiate the conversation. They ask the questions. They accept the invitation to remain with Jesus. And then they go and recruit others. I want to revisit this text and engage in what Will Gaffney calls a sacred imagination, a holy imagination. Because I wonder how well these followers knew each other these first disciples of Jesus in John's gospel. The basic story here is that John, the witnesser, shared with his own disciples that the man walking by them is the Lamb of God. Some of his followers, including Andrew, began following or literally walking behind Jesus. And Jesus turns to them and asks, what are you looking for? To which they respond, Rabbi, teacher, where are you Staying, abiding, remaining. At this point, Jesus offers them an invitation to come and see. And they do. They remain with him. Andrew shares this news with his brother Simon, who joins the group and receives a new name right away in John's gospel. He becomes Peter, Cephas, the rock. It's the next day when Jesus decides to go to Galilee, and that's where he finds Philip, who was from Bethsaida, the same hometown as the brothers. So here's the holy imagination here. I wonder if they knew each other. This is the only time in this call story that Jesus initiates the conversation with a follow me. And I wonder why it is here that Jesus picks Philip, invites Philip. My holy imagination reaches back into those relationships with kids from my hometown, from my home church. Those children and people who to this day remain close to me, even though I do not see them every day or share with them every day, because they were there when I got lost at the church picnic and I drank too much homemade root beer and got really sick on the 4th of July. 
those are the same people that when their brother, their father, their mother died, I shed real tears of loss and sorrow. Because that is a community that formed my faith. And everywhere I go and share my faith, I am sharing their faith too. Those are the people who shared the love of God with me when all I cared about was candy and gold stars on a chart on a wall. And maybe as I'm sharing all of this, you're thinking about those people in your own life, from your own before, whether it was life back on a farm or on a block or even here in this sanctuary. And I wonder what that must have been like to go to those friends with whom you had shared all of those big and little events of life that you share when you're living in community with others, the births and the deaths and the graduations as well as those everyday moments, and you share this one thing that you have seen, that you have been looking for and waiting for and watching for as a community together. When you see the Lamb of God, the teacher, the Lord, and I imagine that there was great incitement in their voices as they came together for the first time and realized, oh, here we are. Look at this. Isn't this a great, amazing new adventure for all of us? It's just like old times, but it's not at all like old times. Old friendships, old relationships, but new beginnings. Philip, of course, we know, runs to tell Nathaniel, who gives us a dose of reality. And it's really Nathaniel here that the f story focuses on because Nathaniel returns with sarcasm. He's cynical, he's real. And I know that this text is often used as an evangelism text, an illustration of how the good news is spread. So I'm thankful for the inclusion of Nathaniel's cynicism here. Philip says, we have found him, the one to, that has been prophesied, Jesus bar Joseph of Nazareth. And Nathaniel's response is, um, I don't think so. From Nazareth? It's a little too human, don't you think? You really think God is in Nazareth? Dorothy A. Lee says, Nathaniel is something of a character here, rather cynical at first and grudging in his response to Philip, but without hidden malice. What you see is what you get with Nathaniel. And the cynicism has some basis because, after all, there are no prophecies of the Messiah coming from Galilee. Are there? But Philip insists that he come and see. And he brings him to Jesus, who, not really phased about all of this, says, in my holy imagination, he's laughing and he has a twinkle in his eye. Wow, you call it like it is, don't you? You just say what you see. Nathaniel here isn't wrong. He's asking a question that every single one of Jesus' disciples then and now should be asking. It's the question that we should be asking ourselves. Do we really believe that this everydayness is where God chooses to dwell? In this place that I know so well, with these people that I know so well, does God really choose to come here? And with a mischievous laugh, God responds, yes, yes, dear friends, I really do choose you. And I choose this place and I choose this community. This is where I dwell among you, with you, by you, and for you. Jesus has struck a nerve and Nathaniel says, how do you even know me? Even more suspicious than he already was. Which is exactly how this good news is usually received. And then Jesus shares what will change Nathaniel's life. I saw you, he says. Friends, this is something. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen fig trees, but I did recently. And the ones that I saw were very tall and very willowy, and it would be really, really easy to hide among them. 
It would be so easy to get lost and be lost and stay lost. And I wonder if that's really what his intention was and why Philip had to go into the trees to find him. And I wonder if that's what John is setting up here, that Jesus sees those who are lost. And that what is so amazing to Nathaniel is that he was seen even though he was hiding. And I wonder what this means for you and for me. And if this is meant to be a part of our life and our calling, that yes, we are to go to those circles of friends and communities that have been with us forever. But we are also to go to those who are lost, who have been lost along the way. And maybe there are some that we are to go to that have never been seen. Right here in our community, in this community of faith, in this great city, in our church and in our world, those people that we've never seen and never noticed, even though they have always been with us. Now, I don't know the full history of First Presbyterian Church of Lincoln, Nebraska, but here's some what, of what I do know about you and what I have heard about you, even on the other side of this great city. You, dear friends, are Remainers. Since 1869, you have grown and changed along with the state of Nebraska. And you have remained steady in your commitment to God's activity in this place, in this community, in this neighborhood. I know that you care about the hungry, that you value your connections with the South Sudan, that you welcome the diversity of the communities that gather here in this building. I know that you are committed to seeing those who are hiding among the trees. I know that there are a lot of really good people here. I know many of you. I have heard firsthand the stories about how fiercely you love and care for one another, which is an important part of this passage as well, that Jesus calls these friends back into community with each other. James Howell notes how vital this is in God's incarnate presence, saying Jesus finds one, not even two, but four and then goes on to seek more. He does not seem to be interested in solo spirituality or the lone believer. We believe to find ourselves in Jesus' community together. We need one another. We need good company. We need friends. I believe that the result of all this human activity is that God is revealed in the process. And that's part of what we are doing when we are living out community together. And it's a huge part of this story. It's a huge part of our story and who I believe God is calling the church to be today. I think that the world is really cynical about us. And I think that they have a reason to be cynical. I get it. I do. There are a lot of things that the church needs to confess and take responsibility for. For all of those many ways that we have fallen short of being the body of Christ in the world. I believe the church has also done a lot of really good work throughout history to remain, to abide, to provide sanctuary and safety and identity and wholeness, to see one another. I believe the role of the church now and the edge that we are standing on together has us asking the question, can we together believe in the love and power of a God who invites us to come and see, to remain and abide, and to be the body of Christ in the world today? Can we lift each other up as communities of faith, as the community of faith all around the world and say, I see you, come and see. To invite each other into this great community that we're all a part of. I believe 
that when we do that, God is revealed in our midst. This text ends with this great vision of this great revelation of God and the promise of seeing God in the least likely of places. In the most human, in the most unexpected places. And it gives us this promise of the future that we ain't seen nothing yet. Amen.